You're listening to The World at Eat with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in nationalist news. Highlights of the news today, Monday the 15th of April. British history syllabus attacked. Christian worker at Heathrow granted right to appeal sacking. Fears of Muslim tensions in higher security prisons. French police contaminate DNA from Alps massacre crime scene. Italy, arsenic outside Rome, a true emergency, says Health Minister. Turkish president warns of Holocaust if intolerance continues. Syria, chemical weapons used. Egypt's Islamic government continues Coptic persecution. Mysterious stone structure discovered beneath Sea of Galilee. Thought for the day, miseria me. And finally, I used to know that signpost, or did I? UK News. British history syllabus attacked. The Muslim Council of Britain campaign to include Islamic history in the UK school curriculum is gaining support. The campaign attacks new plans for teaching history in British schools, permitting reference to Islam's trade, cultural and military achievements. Mohammed Amin from campaign group Curriculum for Cohesion told the Huffington Post, This is not just about educating Muslims. This is about those young pupils who hear nothing about Islam at school and grow up thinking Muslims have contributed nothing to the world apart from terrorism. Those children could grow up to join the English Defence League. The campaign is championed by Matthew Wilkinson, a former Eton head boy who converted to Islam, and supported by high-profile patrons including MP Sadiq Khan and Rabbi Baroness Julie Neuberger. The council concludes that the present draft curriculum would fail to teach a true picture of the past that prepares our children for life in 21st century Britain. At the same time, non-Muslim children will grow up believing that Muslims have contributed nothing of value to Britain. World Date states, they would join what? He's got to be kidding. They'll say anything to put their point across, won't they? Christian worker at Heathrow granted right to appeal sacking. A Christian worker who claims she was sacked from her job at Heathrow following a race-hate campaign by Muslim extremists today vowed to take her unfair dismissal case all the way to Luxembourg to the European Court of Justice. Nohad Halawi allegedly weathered cruel rumours that she was anti-Islamist on top of a systematic catalogue of intimidation that included telling the 40-year-old that she could go to hell if she didn't convert to Islam. She also claims extremist colleagues brought the Koran to work to try and convert people to Islam and even handed out leaflets promoting terrorism, as well as declaring that it was a shame the failed July the 21st London bombings did not go off. Having taken her tribunal case to the courts in 2011, Halawi lost it after it was ruled that as a part-timer and commission-based freelance, she was not a staff employee. Today, however, she won the right to appeal. Mrs Halawi said that she once found extremist leaflets in one of her Muslim colleagues' drawers, but the airport turned a blind eye. She said, management told him to throw them away. I later found out he'd been sacked from other terminals for handing them out and inciting religious hatred, but duty-free covered it up as they are scared of being labelled Islamophobic. Fears of Muslim tensions in high security prison HMP Full Sutton has been home to some of Britain's most violent and notorious criminals, including serial killer Dennis Nilsson, M25 road rage killer Kenneth Noy and Charles Bronson, is now in the firing line because staff and other inmates do not relate well to its Muslim population. The Chief Inspector of Prisons has warned more needs to be done to tackle simmering religious and racial tensions in a high-security dale in Yorkshire, which houses some of the country's most dangerous inmates. A report published today has highlighted a growing resentment among Muslim prisoners descended HMP Full Sutton near York who believe they are being persecuted by staff and other inmates because of their beliefs. Concerns have already been voiced that perceived injustices amongst prisoners could lead them to embracing extremism on their release and heighten the risk of terrorist attacks. The Chief Inspector of Prisons, Nick Hardwick, has stressed that concerted efforts need to be undertaken to counter accusations from Muslim and ethnic minority inmates that they are being discriminated against. 
While an unannounced five-day inspection of the prison in December didn't find any specific evidence of the perceptions of the Muslim and ethnic minority inmates, Mr Hardwick has stressed it remains an area of concern. World date comments. The authorities will run from this sort of statement like Jack Rabbit's. No one in this country is willing to actually face the problem that our prisons are overcrowded with foreigners who are butting heads with our own indigenous criminals. It is not a good situation. European news. French police contaminate DNA from Alps massacre crime scene. French police contaminated vital evidence from the Alpine beauty spot where four people, including members of a British Iraqi family, were gunned down in cold blood it emerged today. It is the latest in a catalogue of disastrous blunders which have prompted senior investigators to admit that the case may never be solved. Detectives initially thought mystery DNA found at the site of the quadruple murder might lead to the identification of the killer. It was found in the isolated lay-by near Lake Annecy where Syed Al-Hili, 50, died alongside his wife Iqbal, 47, and his mother-in-law Sahalia Al-Alaf, 74, in their BMW car on September the 5th. Sylvain Mollier, a 45-year-old French cyclist, was also killed in the bloodbath, which is believed to have been carried out by at least one gunman brandishing a pistol. But Eric Malou, the Annecy prosecutor who is leading the inquiry, now admits that an expert working for a police forensic team accidentally contaminated crime scene material with his own DNA. Italy, arsenic outside Rome, a true emergency, says Health Minister. Italy's health minister on Friday said that high arsenic levels in drinking water in 50 cities and towns in the Lazio region around Rome amounted to a true emergency. We can't wait any longer for a solution, Renato Balduzzi told ANSA. In January, authorities banned public drinking water in 32 areas of Lazio, mainly around the city of Viterbo, north of Rome, after arsenic levels were found to be over the European Union limit of 10 micrograms per litre. On Friday, a study showed that the level of arsenic found in people who have drunk water in and around Viterbo is twice that found among the general population of Italy. Great concentrations have been found in children, said the report from the Higher Health Institute, ISS, which examined residents of Viterbo and 16 nearby towns. Lower risks were found in people using public water in Rome and Latina, two other Lazio provincial capitals, the ISS said. The World Health Organization says arsenic can cause cancer and the EU set limits on its presence in drinking water in 2001. Turkish president warns of Holocaust if intolerance continues. European countries will face new humanitarian tragedies leading to mass killings of people if they continue in their failure to embrace tolerance towards different cultures and religions, President Abdullah Gül has warned. Islam and migrants have been a reality in Europe for centuries. As long as the continent of Europe doesn't approach segments which are different from the majority with tolerance, particularly in regards to religion, an occurrence of new inquisitions and holocausts, as well as incidents evoking Srebrenica, are probable, Gull said yesterday. His strongly worded remarks came as he delivered a keynote speech at the opening of a two-day international symposium on Migration, Islam and Multiculturality in Europe, arranged by Hasatepe's University's Migration and Politics Research Centre. When politics begins otherizing a segment, then we see an alienation of migrants and minorities from the country in which they live and from the society in which they live as an inevitable consequence. As seen in countless examples in history, countries which have been able to perpetuate societal and cultural diversity and unity and harmony have stood out in history. Correspondingly, countries which have exerted efforts to either destroy or put pressure on societal and cultural diversity due to different fears have first of all lost their human richness. Subsequently, they have experienced a loss of economic and political power, the President said. World at Eight says... Words, just preparatory words from this Muslim. He is preparing Europe for the caliphate to come. He is virtually warning us not to do anything about it. Gull is using Bosnia as a lesson in history. That Muslims can kill Kafirs and not be seen as responsible, but vice versa, and there is all hell to pay. By word of history, Europe has not been the dumping ground for millions of Muslims since 1683, when we finally got rid of the vermin. We can learn nothing of tolerance from these people. 
What goes around comes around. World news. Syria, chemical weapons used. Western nations have hard evidence chemical weapons have been used at least once in the Syrian war. But UN investigators are now unlikely to get into the country, diplomats say. In one case, we have hard evidence, a Western diplomat told reporters on Thursday, commenting on the rival claims. There are several examples where we are quite sure that shells with chemicals have been used in a very sporadic way, he added, without giving details. Britain and France have submitted information to the United Nations about allegations government forces used chemical arms in the city of Oms on December 23rd and at Atabaya near Damascus last month. According to the Times of London, UK Ministry of Defence says that chemical weapons were used in the Syrian conflict after scientists analysed soil smuggled out of the country. The British team are unable to say whether the chemical had been used by Syrian government forces or rebel fighters battling to topple the government of President Bashir al-Assad. The chairman of the US and House Intelligence Committee, Representative Mike Rogers, later said that there is a high probability that Syria used chemical weapons in the ongoing civil war. We need that final verification, but given everything we know over the last year and a half, I would come to the conclusion that they are either positioned for use and ready to do that, or in fact have been used, he said. World Date says, It's the Western powers that are sabre-rattling on the wrong side, of course, not the Syrian government, but the jihadists. What is wrong with us? Egypt's Islamic government continues Coptic persecution. Egypt political intellectual and writer Amin al-Mahdi described the recent assault on St. Mark's Cathedral and Al-Azhar earlier as an attempt for sectarian fragmentation by the Muslim Brotherhood in order to control Egyptian society. Mahdi said that the attack by the Interior Ministry on the Coptic youth inside the cathedral during the funeral of the victims of El Kosos City was aimed at suppressing Copts. Issam al-Haddad, President Morsi's assistant on foreign affairs, published a statement on Facebook saying that during a funeral of Christians on Monday, some angry mourners attacked passing cars. This led to some people near the cathedral to open fire and throw rocks, which escalated into an exchange of gunfire which killed two and injured 89, according to security officials. Marianne Samar knelt and prayed for the Coptic Christians killed in that recent spasm of sectarian violence that has further shaken a nation engulfed in economic and political anxieties. I feel unsafe, said Samir, a high school philosophy teacher with a cross tattooed on her wrist. The Islamists want war, they want strife, but this is our land too. It's a country blessed by God and there's no way we'll leave it to them. Pope Tawadras warned that Egypt is collapsing under Morsi's faltering rule, pointing blame at the Islamist president for failing to protect the church's main cathedral after a mob attack on Sunday. Mysterious stone structure discovered beneath the Sea of Galilee. A giant monumental stone structure discovered beneath the waters of the Sea of Galilee in Israel has archaeologists puzzles as to its purpose and even how long ago it was built. The mysterious structure is cone-shaped, made of unhewn basalt cobbles and boulders, and weighs an estimated 60,000 tonnes, the researchers said. That makes it heavier than most modern-day warships. Rising nearly 32 feet, 10 metres high, it has a diameter of about 230 feet, 70 metres. To put that in perspective, the outer stone circle of Stonehenge has a diameter just half that, with its tallest stones not reaching that height. It appears to be a giant cairn, rocks piled on top of each other. Structures like this are known from elsewhere in the world and are sometimes used to mark burials. Researchers don't know if the newly discovered structure was used for this purpose. World Date says fascinating, probably built when the Sea of Galilee was dry land, could be a forerunner of a pyramid or a temple, or indeed part of a larger city. Why are the banksters telling us to sell our gold when they're hoarding gold like crazy? The big banks are breathlessly proclaiming that now is the time to sell your gold. They are warning that we have now entered a bear market for gold and that the price of gold will continue to decline for the rest of the year. So should we believe them? Well, their warnings might be more credible if the central banks of the world were not hoarding gold like crazy. During 2012, central bank gold buying was at highest level that we have seen in almost 50 years. Meanwhile, insider buying of gold stocks has now reached multi-year highs and the US Mint 
can't even keep up with the insatiable demand for silver eagle coins. So what in the world is actually going on here? Right now, the central banks of the world are indulging in a money-printing binge that reminds many of what happened during the early days of the Weimar Republic. When you flood the financial system with paper money, that is eventually going to cause the prices for hard assets to go up dramatically. Could it be possible that the banksters are trying to drive down the price of both gold and silver so they can gobble it up cheaply? Do they want to be the ones sitting on all of the real money once the paper money bubble that we are living in finally bursts? World Date writes, Well, you can discount the UK in all this. Brown got rid of all our gold years ago when it was cheap. Give Labour power over money and kiss it all goodbye. Well done to that man for sheer incompetence. Thought for the day. Misery and me. All right, all right. Rant mode coming on. I know it's very easy to blame everyone and everything when a game plan goes wrong, but when it's a lifeline that goes out of the window, one feels slightly more justified. Our large and very precious Japanese tank of a car is rather defunct. Well, certainly for long journeys and the long haul. I'm especially miffed because it's our only means of transport in the wilds of Hampshire, which means ostensibly we will quietly mould away, not something I did envisage. What has made me hopping mad is that if I were a newcomer, immigrant, migrant, asylum seeker, even Eastern European slave worker, I'd be able to go to the benefits people and have monies up to £2,000 for a new car. As it is, I'm just a British citizen, born and bred, have worked most of my life, raised children without benefits and paid my way. All this, of course, is not counted against the masses who enter this country, whether wanted or needed or not, and you, the working taxpayer, pays for them to acquire what I apparently can't. Oh, buy a bicycle, I hear. Oh, yeah? You try cycling to party meetings, conferences, EC meetings and all the general usual things that occur in the north of our once great country. Not only would Dale and I have to ride tandem, which would lead to an instant domestic and probable divorce, but if we actually reached our far-flung destination, we would then have to turn tail and cycle right back home. Also, the prospect of facing my beloved's backside for the greater portion of what would be a 24-hour journey up to the furthest reaches of our party goings-on doesn't appeal at all. So therefore, I'm not a happy bunny. In fact, I'm a very miserable bunny indeed. Further stoking my ire over the weekend were the pictures on the news of the riots in Newcastle city centre. Over what? Not the state of the nation, not the economic crisis, not the EU, not lack of work or prospects, not immigration, not even the spare room tax, not the fact that our churches are getting even emptier, not even Maggie and her funeral. It was football. Not even rugger that boasts the right shape ball, but football. When I saw that middle-aged tub pot with grubby jeans punch that horse, that did it. It completely did it for me. I was hoping the GG would turn round and floor him with a hoof, but he didn't, bless him. Luckily, he was tackled to the ground by a police persona and hopefully taken away to be incarcerated for life. The horse concerned is OK, bless him. Looking at those scenes were reminiscent of the dark days of the 70s. I was wondering if any of those drunken louts rioting actually knew what was happening to their part of the world, apart from, of course, football games. Not all the misery in the North was due to Maggie versus the miners and the unions, although everyone needs someone to hate and she fits their bill at the moment. A sort of nine-day wonder affair. Loss of industry, loss of the old-fashioned high streets, loss of small shops and businesses is down to not just the economic state, which has been shifting about for many years under many governments, but the takeover of computers and the web unified with massive immigration into that part of the country. Put that with an already defunct workforce, with at least a couple of generations not working, and an increasing change in national attitudes from I work, therefore I deserve, to I don't work, therefore I deserve, and we have a problem. Compile it with what is laughingly called an education system that turns out white louts and drunken pregnant girls whilst promoting ethnics to a much better education than they would receive in their home countries and many parts of this country are already set on a collision course of unrest. Don't for one minute think that the days of the last summer riots, as they are lovingly called, are over. There are small riots every day in certain parts of the country which never get publicised. 
for fear of raising community differences within those areas and encouraging conflict amongst ethnic and indigenous communities. Black on white crimes are rarely if ever reported except initially and the identification of the black perp is always blotted out, whilst the white perp is shown in technicolour at every opportunity. No none identification for legal reasons there. So in an awful way these pictures and videos of the football rioters fall right into the hands of the leftist Marxist multicultural lovies. In fact, when I saw them, if there had been a mosque handy, I would have converted. I was so ashamed of my fellow Brits. I am and have never been a goody-goody, but the sight of those less-than-men punching horses and setting fire to things was repellent. Rather, as the even more horrible drunken baby females tottering from drinking hole to drinking hole on a Friday night up in that area and peeing in the gutter are not for the faint-hearted. What does it say about our society? People may not like to hear the truth, but sometimes it comes and smacks one upside the head without knowing it, and I think this time has come. We nationalists give a good argument against massive immigration and all the problems it brings to social cohesion, but in a perfect world or a different mindset, the people being colonised and used would band together and do something about it. What does the average Brit do? Whether from north or south, they virtually do the same thing. A lot of rabbit but they do virtually nothing. When they do have a unified nationalist party, they set about de-unifying it. They bicker and bitch and set up splinter groups that will never see the light of day. They are party to various successive government-funded democratic political groups to whom the nearest thing to nationalism is getting out of the EU card, which ain't never going to happen. Well, certainly not unless we all get very much stronger support from the great British whatever. So in reality, you can forget that issue. The powers that be have made sure that if you fight any sort of agenda on immigration, you are a racist party. And that appeals to the lazy Brits who can't be bothered to even look at the news or think, because they aren't racist or Nazis, are they? No, they're really nothing at all. So over the weekend, we saw the great disenfranchised North stepping up to the mark. If only they'd been rioting over something more worthy. I could have had some sympathy, but a ball being kicked about by a load of foreigners and managed by yet another foreigner, who, surprise, surprise, is not popular because he has fascist views, was a bit too much to take. What the North, and indeed most of England, need is a double dose of fascist views. Hell, they can't be worse than what we have, which is no real order or sense of community or even well-being. We all dwell on what we haven't got and what we are worth, not how we can get it and are we really worth it. Well, in the case of my car, I haven't got a clue how to get one, but yes, I am worth it. My Monday message is that I would like all the drinks billed for that load of watsits in Newcastle paid into my account and I could get a brand new car immediately. How about that? That works for me. Way hey, the man. Um, and finally, I used to know that signpost, or did I? OK, OK, you can forget about donating your bits and pieces when you kick the bucket. The creme will take any metal body parts and recycle them into road signs, lampposts, car parts and aircraft engines after people are cremated and hopefully very dead. A metal recovery scheme run by the UK Crematoria has raised almost £1 million for charity since it began operating in Britain in 2004. The recycling of metals recovered from cremation scheme is run by the Institute of Cemetery and Crematorium Management in partnership with Ortho Metals, a Dutch metal recycling company specialising in recycling medical implants and has been in operation in Europe for 11 years. Steel hips, plates and screws from legs and skulls are collected after a person is cremated and sent off for recycling. Even metal plates and false teeth and tiny fragments and fillings can be recovered and reused together with metal fillings on coffins. High-value metals which survive the thousand-degree cremation are then sold for use in the automobile and aeronautical industries. They include cobalt and titanium found in some implants and dental work. Cobalt is used in aircraft engines, but other less valuable metals are smelted down and sold for more general use including road signs, motorway barriers and lampposts. Ruud Verburn, owner of Ortho Metal, said, Metals reclaimed from cremations are being increasingly reused. What is important is that the metals are being recycled, and this is a growing business both in Britain and elsewhere in Europe. 
Any profits made from the process are then donated to death-related charities such as bereavement support groups, the Heart Foundation and Cancer Research. Apparently, around half Britain's 260 crematoriums have signed up to the scheme, which is generating 75 tonnes of metal a year. Relatives are asked if they want to keep the metal parts of loved ones and then can sign a consent form. One of the crematoriums in the scheme is at Western Super Mayor in Somerset, which has an average of four to five services a day. Even the current status of metal body parts being buried in the grounds of the crematoriums is being changed to facilitate the new charity-based awfulness, as the new legislation means this will no longer be possible. This presenter says, I told you, Soylent Green is around the corner. Now the Dutch government leans towards green environmentalist ideals with left socialist leanings. Just imagine a nationalist or right-wing government bringing this into being. Does it smack of concentration camps? Yup, it does to me. Just imagine the media of the British National Party, the Front National or even Golden Dawn brought this one in. The papers would have piggies of piles of shoes, fillings, jewellery and everything else heaped up from Auschwitz on the front page. But in this socialist country? All part of the game plan, mate, is soon it will be skin lampshades, spot the tattoos. Watch and learn. You've been listening to The World at Eight. I am Lynn Mozart. I wish you all a very good night. <laughs>